I'm uh, sharing screen, sharing the cam, everything looks good. Please let me know if everything looks good. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Matt. And uh, good evening. Good morning, everybody. Um, yet another opcode, uh, virtual opcode conference. And uh, uh, topic today, obviously, mobile trackers. And in particular, I would like to uh, go a bit, uh, say, underground. We want to see a uh, a bit how all this uh, mobile tracking works uh, in a more generic way. Uh, we've all seen uh, Mr. Hook looking at a specific brand of phones. My research was more in the line of uh, applications that everybody, uh, including you, the listeners or the viewers, might have on your phones right now. So with no further ado, um, I will get into it. This whole research actually started uh, in December 2019 when I read an article in the New York Times. And this article, you know, it kind of uh, uh, shake, shaken all the fibers uh, in my body. This article called uh, One Nation Tracked. And this is actually an investigation from the New York Times. They managed to get a database a very large database of uh, uh, locations that were collected uh, by one of these uh, analytics companies. New York Times doesn't actually name which company uh, this data came from, but uh, they say that uh, the data included um, a few billion uh, endpoints. And for instance, the data included the more than 10,000 uh, smartphones that were being tracked uh, as they were hovering around the Central Park in New York. Um, you could actually, based on the IDs that were associated with this data, you can actually pinpoint to one single phone. And from there, you can track the movements of that particular phone um, pretty much, let's say, all over the city. So for instance, this is one of these phones from uh, the uh, Central Park, and they actually see that uh, it uh, beaconed, uh, it sent uh, these telemetry pings back to the, uh, uh, well, unknown uh, company uh, throughout the period, let's say, of a couple of time. Um, and uh, as uh, New York Times uh, puts it, connecting those pings actually reveals a diary of uh, that person's life. You can actually see how they're moving around. Um, obviously the points with the largest number of pings, they are actually things like their home or maybe their work office or their family, or even uh, let's say places where they take lunch or they buy their coffee uh, and so on, which is of course very, very interesting. Now, uh, um, New York Times actually tried to go a bit deeper into this subject and uh, all the data is pretty much anonymized. But again, as uh, Hook showed us that these anonymization IDs can sometimes be de-anonymized. In this, um, this particular case, uh, New York Times were quite easily able, they say, uh, to identify and track important people. So for instance, they followed military officials with security clearances as they drove home at night, or they tracked law enforcement officers as they took their kids to school, or even uh, you know, important rich lawyers and their guests that they traveled uh, from private jets to vacation properties. And all this tracking actually came from looking at a data set uh, of supposedly anonymized data where every single uh, smartphone on the map is in essence just a unique ID. Uh, and of course you might be wondering how can a unique ID disclose somebody's identity? How can you actually find out who is behind that dot? And this is actually what the New York Times, they did and they actually managed to identify some of the people uh, and uh, they show their names in this article again with their permission. So for instance, one case is uh, Mary Melbourne, which is a singer. 
And she performed for various uh, United States presidents, including uh, President Trump. Um, how they tracked her? Well, they were, uh, let's say, we can kind of guess the method they used, but they knew that she basically sang at uh, Trump's uh, inauguration. And then you can just, let's say, find a few other events where she was supposed to be singing. And you just look for any ID in the data set that was present at all these different events. So uh, actually, she's saying that she was quite careful about limiting how um, she shared her location. And she couldn't uh, actually name the application that might have collected this information. Uh, in other case, uh, they um, basically tracked the Microsoft uh, engineer that, uh, well, he made a visit one Tuesday afternoon to a Microsoft competitor, Amazon. And then the following month, he started a new job at Amazon. So it took, let's say, minutes to identify him as Ben Broily, uh, a manager now uh, with Amazon Prime Air. So the ideas uh, that these uh, anonymized user IDs, you know, can um, provide, let's say, a very strong shield from unmasking people's identities is not true. And as uh, the New York Times uh, shows, it's actually quite possible to turn these uh, anonymized IDs into real people's identities. And New York Times, they actually go ahead and they list some of the companies who are working uh, in this location uh, data business. Uh, of course, in addition to the one that we uh, saw, uh, there's, let's say, quite a few of them. And um, there is probably no doubt that this is a very, very uh, productive and uh, growing business at the moment. And I'm sure the number of these companies is actually quite uh, larger. There's probably, I don't know, 10 times more companies uh, who are involving themselves uh, in the development of such uh, libraries. All right, so um, let's talk a bit about why this might be a problem. Now, um, when I was much younger, um, the uh, director of marketing in the company that I was working came to me after a talk and he said, hey, Kostin, I want to ask you one thing. I said, yeah, sure. And what? And he said, please don't use the word problem anymore. Um, you know, in, in the world today, there are no problems. Um, there's actually only opportunities. So I'm going to call this not the problem, but I'm going to call this uh, the opportunity. So what? It's different companies who are engaging in uh, location collection. So actually, uh, just to be entirely fair, would be nice to look at both the positive uh, and potentially negative uses of these tracking technologies. So just let's say a few points on the positive side. For instance, uh, we could use all this location information to uh, identify what are, let's say, the most uh, crowded routes and then to improve transportation systems uh, to make them more efficient. Uh, we can also use this to study epidemics and how uh, you know uh, people move or don't move during uh, things like natural disasters, pandemics, um, testing the uh, efficacy of social distancing, for instance, can be another application. Uh, do all these guidelines from the government actually work and which people follow these guidelines, which percentage of the population is actually compliant. Uh, Let's say there can be even you know, further uses for this, such as, for instance, tracking criminals or crimes that were produced at certain hours in various locations. So if you know that, let's say, a crime occurred at 3 a.m. and 7 minutes uh, in a particular place, you can go ahead and try to see which phones were actually in the area at that time and then to try to identify the criminals. And this is actually happening at the moment. And we've seen this happen um, in various ways, either through the tower locations or through things such as uh, uh, the police uh, uh, supporting uh, companies such as Google for the data. Fortunately, there's also uh, 
potential abuses of these technologies. One very good example here can be tracking journalists uh, and their sources. So the journalists, they can meet with whistleblowers and uh, somebody with access to uh, such data can very easily identify those journalists and then to try to identify their sources and uh, unmask them. Um, this can be used for the purpose of stalkerware, such as stalking celebrities, for instance, or all sorts of abuses, such as keeping tabs on employees. And, you know, kind of to just to summarize or to draw the line and put everything into just one bucket. Um, there's a wonderful book from Shoshana Zubov called The uh, Age of Surveillance Capitalism that I advise you all to uh, buy and uh, read because it's a very interesting book. And in essence, all this information can actually be turned into money um, if you know how. And if you know how to use this information, this can actually be turned into loads of money. So <clears throat> just to summarize, we have both opportunities and risks here. Uh, and there's no problem. Again, there's no problem with this. Again, we need to look from the point of view of an opportunity. All right, so in March, uh, to be honest, this story from the New York Times, um, it kind of feels that uh, it passed. So obviously there were people reading, uh, there were people worrying about it, but then, you know, two days later, everybody forgot about it. And that is the sad things um, about these big stories nowadays and that we see them and then in a couple of days, everybody forgets. So in March 2020, I saw quite an interesting uh, video uh, on Twitter from a company called um, Tectonics. And uh, they have a quite very impressive technology, I, I must say. Um, and uh, why don't we try actually to watch this video together? And I have sound uh, in it as well. And I, I really hope that works. I'll go quiet for a moment while you all watch the movie. We wanted to see the true footprint social gatherings like spring break beach crowds could really have on our society in the face of a global pandemic. To do so, we started with the big picture, powering our engine with billions of anonymized location data points from mobile devices across the globe. Using tectonics, we can then zoom in on specific regions. Here, we focus specifically on just one beach in Fort Lauderdale during the month of March. Again, each of these data points shown on the map corresponds to a unique mobile device active on a given day. You can see clearly that device activity spikes during the two week stretch of early to mid March corresponding to spring break, no surprise. Now, using an analysis called a spider query, we can actually track movement of these devices over the remaining weeks of March, seeing where these devices went after spring breakers left the beach. As we zoom further and further out, it becomes clear just how massive the potential impact just one single beach gathering can have in spreading this virus across our nation. It can be hard for us to realize sometimes just how connected our world really is until the data tells the stories that we just can't see. All right. So uh, just as a disclaimer, I absolutely agree uh, with the conclusion of this video, which is that uh, um, social distancing really works, but the potential um, of all this to, uh, uh, you know, turn the, uh, the spreading of COVID into a nightmare is there. So of course that there's many companies out there who have, uh, been pitching their technologies and how they can be used for the purpose of uh, tracking the uh, COVID-19 spread. Um, I don't know if you guys noticed, but one of the interesting things was uh, here uh, in the beginning in this interface, you see the amount of, uh, uh, well, uh, telemetry uh, points they have, and there was about 13 billion telemetry points. All right. Uh, after this video, to be honest, there were a couple of questions uh, kind of unanswered. And for instance, uh, one of them uh, came from Colin Anderson, uh, who is a researcher that I respect a lot. And he uh, wrote on Twitter uh, a question, where do you get your location data? Are you the first party for any of these apps? And 
what are the specific methods for anonymization? So kind of, let's say this question also triggered uh, my interest and especially I thought that uh, if Colin doesn't know the answer to these questions, um, maybe it's actually a topic worth researching. So one of the things that attracts your attention in this um, uh, post was the fact that they said a partnership with Exmouth Social. And if you remember the New York Times article, it's actually there's Exmouth right there in this uh, selection of companies who are working in the location data business. So the things, you know, they kind of connect. Uh, here we go. We have another example, practical example of uh, how the data, the telemetry and location data is uh, getting collected and how it can actually be used. Uh, in this case, why not for very uh, good purposes? Uh, of course, from my point of view, the first question that came to my mind when I, when I saw this is, uh, am I a ship? Am I one of the points in these graphics? Well, uh, is my phone or are my phones actually uh, running some of these applications, sending the telemetry uh, 24 seven to their developers and further being sold through different networks to other entities and so on and so on. Uh, the only issue is how to check, how to find out if actually any of the apps on my phone um, do send telemetry. Um, actually, if you go to the XMOD website, uh, they have a uh, easy to integrate SDK and uh, if you look there, uh, they kind of recommend app developers to integrate this ad-free um, SDK and basically get a revenue stream out of it, which means you're gonna get uh, paid in money for binding this SDK in your uh, smartphone app. And there's no advertisement, like what are the most annoying things about free smartphone apps? Those are the ads. In this case, there's no ads, so that's good. And actually, there's a monthly earning calculator there. And I put uh, two random numbers. I said, like, my app has uh, 1,000 uh, United States users, and I have 1,000 global users. And for that, the potential revenue uh, calculated by this uh, small uh, web page app is $33 per month, which comes actually from <coughs> about three cents per user in the United States and 0 0.3 cents for the users outside of the United States. So basically if you're in the States, uh, your privacy is uh, worth about three cents per user. If you live like myself somewhere else, like Romania, your privacy is worth about 0 0.3 cents per month. Um, and the good news is that it's quite easy actually to install this um, SDK in your app. Uh, it is a quite efficient, uh, battery efficient location collection software. So at this point, I was saying to myself, this is wonderful. How do I get the SDK? I need this SDK for myself so that I can see how it works so that I can check if any applications on my phone actually have this SDK integrated. So uh, there's an FAQ on the XMODE website and there's a couple of questions. Uh, does your SDK impact the user interface? No, it's all in the background. So that means it's invisible. Does it affect the battery life? Well, typically one to 3% battery drain. How large is it? Half a meg. And uh, is this legal? This is a very, very important question. Is this legal? And uh, the answer is most definitely Apple, Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, they all monetize on their data one way or another. And without GDPR compliant SDK, we make sure everything is kosher. So everything looks good from this point of view, let's say, but the question remains, how can we find the SDK? Um, now, with a bit of searching on Google, actually I came by a website uh, on GitHub where somebody has a source code for a um, smartphone app, uh, an Android app called Smart Speedometer. 
And actually I noticed that there was a small line in there. Uh, you see it is uh, X mode uh, SDK dot in it. Uh, it's commented out, meaning that, uh, well, he removed this from the source code before making it public, maybe because he's not allowed to publish the SDK. Uh, but nevertheless, this kind of gave me an idea. What if we try to find other applications which have this uh, X mode SDK dot in it in them? So I turned to my favorite uh, Yara hunting platform. So, uh, which is a virus total malware intelligence. He put together a very simple Yara rule uh, that just has one string in there, which is X mod SDK. I fire up the rule, I waited the bet, and I got 29 matches for that. And uh, there's also 500 other matches for the pro users. I, to be honest, I'm not a pro user myself, I'm just a regular user, but even in that situation, 29 matches are just enough to get me started. So I took effectively the, uh, you know, in alphabetical order by hash, I took the first hash from there and I started looking into it a bit to see uh, what it does. So this is a uh, an application for Android. And the nice thing about VirusTotal, it actually, um, it shows you a bit of behavior, how this application behaves. And there's a bunch of URLs that this application tried to contact. For instance, uh, there's one signal. And I was wondering if this one signal is actually the X mode SDK, but somehow it doesn't sound. So at this point, I don't see anything in there which is X mode related, but I looked at the permissions for this Android app and uh, we have uh, access to the find location, which in other words is saying that it tries to get your exact location through the GPS. So this looks good. It means that uh, whatever we found here has the potential to be interesting. So I opened this in my favorite uh, viewer, uh, which is uh, Hugh. And as I was looking a bit through um, uh, the DEX file, this is basically classes.dex. I did search for X mode in there, and I did find, as you can see in there, X mode SDK.java, X mode service, and so on, and then a bunch of base 64 encoded strings. And uh, immediately this attracted my attention. I thought, obviously, the telemetry endpoints must be encrypted in a way so you can't easily see them in the binary, uh, which make sense, um, which is also why we can't immediately see anything like, uh, I don't know, xmode.com in the binary. Uh, but these strings, these base 64 encoded strings, they looked very interesting to me. And I had the feeling that they are uh, encrypted in a very poor fashion. So I took them into CyberChef, um, one of them. Then I just applied the base 64 decode and then I applied the XOR brute force and immediately there's something in there which attracts uh, your attention and that's a plain text url atbbearclaw.com and so on so i went there to check uh, the who is record for bear cloud there's like uh, who is privacy protected 500 uh, days old if you go to the website it says welcome to nginx if you ping the exact endpoint actually you get a response. So that means that the website is operational and the endpoint for, for this actually works, um, which is all quite interesting. Later I did a search on Google and I was able to find the research from uh, Checkpoint and this uh, uh, research from Checkpoint actually talks about an Android app uh, fraud, the uh, bear cloud and Haken clickers. So there you go, I just discovered uh, a clicker that was embedded in the application, which is all very interesting, but sadly it's not what we were looking for. So I took another string. Well, honestly speaking, I decrypted all of them. Here's another example. This one decodes to udata elephantdata.net. What's that? We can go to their website and we see that Elephant Data is a company that wants to build a better business through big data. Elephant Data provides market intelligence solutions and app analytics to help you win your market. Interesting, interesting, but still not 
the X mode SDK that we were looking for. Now I keep looking. At this point, I just um, decompiled the entire APK. And one of the things in there, which was called P014IO, actually it does have inside uh, a function which is uh, called initialize if granted permissions. And this is part of the X mode SDK class. So bingo, we found the X mode SDK class. So as I kept looking around, uh, trying to see exactly all the data, where the data is going, I discovered that actually it was going in plain text to this uh, Amazon Web Services uh, address, uh, which is not obfuscated or anything. So everything is in plain text. And I did check in the library to see what kind of data is going there. And this actually can be found uh, by jumping through a few classes, location intent service, which uses fetch data utils, which in the end uses location X mode. And this um, function actually collects a couple of things such as the altitude, latitude, longitude, bearing time, speed, accuracy, uh, battery level, um, then a few other network related identifiers, including the Wi-Fi SSIDs which is all kind of interesting information, which is collected again, whenever there's a location change uh, notification. Um, and by the way, if you're wondering, what did we analyze here? Well, this is a application that is called the snow day calculator. So you need to input your location or zip code, and then you get some predictions for it. If you check it on Google Play, uh, the people are not very happy with it, unfortunately. As one guy here commenting that, uh, well, he had the app for a while, but then he opened the phone and uh, the phone said that the app was a virus and this never happened to him before. If we look a bit further, we see that uh, there's about 5,000 installs for this application. So. Just to summarize again, what we saw inside just one application, there's the X mode SDK in there. There's bear cloud, there's elephant data. There's one signal, I, we didn't check that. Remember we saw it in the telemetry and potentially there's a few others. But well, at this point I decided to write a better Yara. So I just took this particular telemetry endpoint. Uh, I wrote the Yara, I ran it again on virus total. This time, this gave me 2019 matches and plus 4,000 other pros. And I was able to connect these to about 240 unique applications, uh, application names that are available through app stores such as Google Play. Um, obviously, I didn't analyze all of them by hand, so I try to do some statistics to better understand what's inside this application. So for instance, I wanted to see what are the most uh, common strings in this application. So for instance, um, what we see here, things like example.com, uh, Wikipedia, Google, uh, plus Google.com. There we have app measurement, and app measurement is another uh, telemetry SDK. You see it in there with 1,170 hits. And then, you know, a few others uh, in there. So what is potentially, let's say, more interesting is the number of installs. So I did a bit of scripting in there. I took pretty much uh, all these uh, applications. So I did some scripting to uh, try to get the number of installs from the Google Play Store for every single one of them. So for instance, there's one of these applications which has over 10 million installs. And uh, if you look there at the interactive elements, it shares your location uh, and it has in-app purchases. So sharing your location, 10 million installs, uh, quite interesting. So I pretty much counted everything together to see how many applications uh, we have in total and how many potential installs. And the number that I came up is about uh, half a billion installs with a very, let's say, small footnote in there, which is that this is the theoretical number of max installs if all the installs are unique. And in my opinion, most likely they're not unique. Meaning um, if there's two applications, each one with 10 million installations, then there's a good chance that it's not 10 million people and 10 million people, but it's quite possible that 5 million people have both applications at the same time, which is why I say up to 
half a billion installs. Well, nevertheless, if you combine everything together, the smallest number was uh, over 100 million installations. So I think that that is still significant. So, well, just to summarize and a few conclusions, um, there's practically hundreds of uh, free and paid smartphone apps, which are uh, linked with this mobile SDKs to collect your location. And uh, well, is this legal? Most definitely, as you can see, as you have seen there on the XMOD website. Actually, I think there's uh, some discussion around this topic that in reality, there's no laws which regulate how this information can be collected or used. Uh, what is for sure, it is true that this data could be used for good purposes, but at the same time, it can also be used for, let's call them other purposes. And we had just uh, one, one application there that was linked to half a dozen SDK. And why, why is this happening? Well, obviously all the app developers, they want to maximize their profits. So they link together different SDKs. They don't link just one, they link all of them. So that's like $33 multiplied six from you know, six different SDKs. So in reality, the location goes not to just one, but to many different uh, of these analytic uh, companies. And I have uh, the feeling that the COVID-19 tracing apps will likely kind of increase and contribute uh, this location uh, collection business in the future. So what about solutions for these uh, opportunities? Well, if you've seen my story, uh, one about catching APTs at home, uh, how to tap your home internet, one of the first things I did was to check my uh, internet logs for that particular endpoint. And I was happy to discover there was no traffic from any of my phones to that endpoint. The reason being that I don't have any of those 240 applications installed on my phone. Um, I put together a list. Uh, you can find it on GitHub, github.com, uh, mobile trackers, which is a repository of all the telemetry endpoints uh, that I collected uh, by analyzing different apps. And that includes the ones uh, that uh, Hook uh, found uh, and shared with me as well. So what do you need for this? Uh, basically to run it in an efficient way, um, you need PyHole, obviously. Um, how, how do you get around the problem of, um, uh, let's say, doing this when you're also outside your home, right? Uh, one idea is, for instance, to install WireGuard, uh, set up a VPN server at your home, and then always when you travel or when you're outside, uh, connect to this VPN profile that uses your own custom DNS server with PyHole at home. Uh, and I guess that we're probably wondering uh, if the story is over. Actually, the story continues. Um, yesterday, uh, Guardian Firewall, which by the way was one of the applications uh, that allows you to track all this um, telemetry, they posted on Twitter that uh, the new updated apps with the XML Social uh, SDK, they're using a new telemetry endpoint, which is API myendpoint.io. So I guess this at some point can become a kind of a um, cat and mouse game, identifying telemetry endpoints, changing them, identifying new ones and so on and so on. So I'll leave you with, uh, with these thoughts uh, again. Um, thank you very much. And uh, there's two QR codes in the air. I'll let you discover where these uh, QR codes uh, go by yourselves. And I hope that this was uh, interesting and make sure guys do check uh, if you are a sheep or if you are not a sheep, I think that is a question. <laughs> thanks uh, for the presentation, uh, Kostin, and thanks uh, for joining us back for is this the third time you, that you're speaking? Out of? <laughs> it could be, yes, could be. So, yeah. uh, out of five edition. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry we're, about we're gonna that, start to get complaints you know like uh... <laughs> yeah people get tired of uh, me and my headphones everybody complaining about the green headphones but i like them <laughs> but it's uh it's better than uh most of headphones uh, at least the microphone <laughs> is pretty good uh 
So quick questions from the audience. Uh, so a question from Tara. Does Kostin agree with Shoshana Zuboff felt that the tensions between uh, privacy and surveillance during COVID are positive because they force people to consider what they are willing to live with? Hmm. That's, that's a nice question. I, I haven't heard about uh, this opinion. I didn't know that uh, Shoshana is still uh, commenting on the topic. Uh, come to think of uh, probably yes, I guess that this brings the topic of privacy into attention and people are more and more worried about it. Um, well, uh, everybody is pretty much, let's say, uh, stuck at home with a lot of time to think. So this is uh, when people are stuck and uh, thinking about things, that's probably when uh, uh, there's changes or there's, let's say, positive changes. Yeah, actually, there's a comment in, in the chat from uh, from Ayman who is uh, saying everyone today will accept being tracked for healthy reasons today or tomorrow to prevent future pandemic. Uh, unfortunately, they're the new norm today that evolve uh, so fast from the past. So there's Yaga, uh, who was uh, one of the participants in the disinformation roundtable, who's disagreeing. Although, uh, I do remember that Bo Schneier published a blog post not too long ago uh, where he was saying like mobile applications, uh, like to track people is a dumb idea and that there's probably like two ways that people would uh, accept to be uh, under surveillance and uh, health is uh, w w one of them. Uh, I think it was Bruce uh, Schneier, if I remember correctly. That's an interesting theory. Health <laughs> and maybe security, right? Yeah. Exactly, right, which is what's happening for the past uh, 20 years, right? 19 years, and it's working pretty well. Uh, <laughs> Jaziel, <laughs> Kostin is the C in Opcode. <laughs> and hopefully the O. Oh, yeah. But the O is, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a good one, actually. Um, <laughs> da -da -da, let's scroll down. Uh, question. Besides swapping our smartphones with not so smartphone ones, is there a way to minimize uh, our previous exposure? Um, well, I would say that uh, well, swapping the smartphones with not so smartphones is uh, unfortunately is not a solution for almost everybody, right? So I guess that uh, there's uh, solutions like the ones I showed. You can uh, try to put together lists of these telemetry endpoints, your own custom VPNs. There's even commercial solutions, to be honest. I, the one that I mentioned, the Guardian Firewall, there's another one called uh, Lockdown. It just allow you to, to do exactly that. Um, there's also another suggestion in the chat that I see that you could uh, use the eFoundation uh, OS. Um, Sure, that's another solution. Again, the only uh, kind of worrying part is the kind of applications that you have on the phone. So uh, the uh, eFoundation phones, they, you know, they can come kind of empty. You think you even need to install some kind of a camera photo app and the one that is open source is not as good as the ones that uh, come uh, with the original hardware. Uh, but otherwise, uh, yeah, um, just uh, think about things such as um, Graphene OS, for instance, running on uh, Google Pixels. But not on the a... Pixel 4, right? <laughs> not on the Pixel it's on 4, the old unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. I, hope, uh, I hope they, they port it to the Pixel 4 uh, soon because it's, it's a good choice, it's a solid choice. Again, you still depend on the apps and the question is, um, how many of the apps that you have on your phone, be it whatever, let's say Android, iOS phone, even eFoundation or Graphene, actually send telemetry uh, with things such as the cell ID or the Wi-Fi SSIDs or Bluetooth and so on uh, to unknown telemetry endpoints? Yeah. I mean, I'm seeing, uh, I'm seeing in the chat, you know, like uh, Yaga and Sima saying uh, we need to invite uh, Greg uh, back to discuss about the uh, OPSEC to, mm. <laughs> to see what would be the, the best way of uh, like uh, avoiding, uh, I guess, uh, 
invasive surveillance uh, in 2020. Uh, I mean, I personally I generally use like a, a Nokia as a, my main phone. Uh, but the main reason is like everyone thinks it's because of security, because they know me, but it's just because the battery lasts longer. Like, <laughs> <laughs> makes sense, makes sense, yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's check if there is any more questions. Um, this is a whole debate on privacy is becoming irrelevant. It's not, uh, yeah, yeah, to paraphrase uh, Luke Skywalker, amazing everything you just said is wrong. So, so not everyone will accept being tracked. <laughs> and even those we will want some uh, assurance that only location data is tracked. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, uh, it's gonna be a good uh, transition for uh, next panel, I guess. Um, I'm just going to launch the uh, transitions while everyone is uh, getting ready and uh, we can, uh, you guys can get ready for the uh, transition.